too. I was the Canada U.S. Law Institute scholar in the uh, University of Western Ontario. So I have a, a long history with a big gap in between my, my children at the Institute. I work for a company called Powers Watson Company. Many of you may not have heard of because it's a very good company. Powers Watson is a $3.5 billion publicly traded company that was formed in January 1st by the merger of two of the world's largest employee benefit consulting firms, Towers, Towers Parent, Forster and Crosby, and Watson Wyatt Worldwide. Um, I'm a little unusual also in my background and the background of my company because I'm not a trade lawyer, I'm an in-house counsel, and my responsibility is largely to manage litigation and litigation issues worldwide in the countries where we do business. And we do business in, uh, I believe, 40 countries in the world, including the United States and Canada. Lots and why it's also unusual in that we're not involved in trade between the border, but our clients are large corporations and governments in the world that have to work with that around the world. And two of our key product lines are um, tied to, to helping people manage their workforces across the world uh, in terms of just working with defined, defined benefit plans. And before the merger, Watson Wyatt was the actuary administrator to 20% of the 300 largest pension plans in the world. Um, we obviously do more now. We also do consulting group and health benefits um, and investments for pension funds. So that goes to my area of interest where I'll be speaking today which is on international data privacy regulation. Uh, a very important, really a crucial uh, issue for all of us who do international business and companies who do international business, and something that we think needs, certainly I think, needs attention. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce the rest of our panel. I'll introduce them each one at a time that we can they can identify what they'll be talking about, the harmonies and disharmonies, and then I'll begin with my presentation. First, we have Dr. David Funk, who's chairman and CEO of ACDEG Group in Vancouver, British Columbia. Dr. Funk. I, I, well, I think, uh, first of all, as I said, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I came here really to try to learn about the issues uh, that lawyers are discussing because my job is to look into the future on where uh, we should position our uh, investment and capital uh, and uh, but I would like to uh, discuss today uh, uh, with you some of the issues on how we are running international businesses uh, and how some of these legal frameworks will have an impact on what we do uh, and how we maintain our own security and prosperity in North America. Uh, I'm on the board of the Canadian uh, Manufacturers and Exporters. I'm the immediate past chair. Uh, I'm also on the board of Canadian Standards Association, CSA Group, uh, and uh, uh, also the Canadian uh, Green Chemistry and Engineering Network, uh, and a number of transportation uh, associations. Okay, uh, we also have Timothy Boyle, who's Council of Trade Regulation at Eaton Corporation. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about a number of areas of regulatory convergence uh, close to my focus. I'm the Beaton Corporation here in Cleveland. We do business in about 175 countries and we own about 60,000 employees. Um, and I'm going to focus my comments on some fairly recent changes in Canadian competition law and also uh, in the area of anti-bribery or corruption. And lastly, some comments on some of the securities law privileges. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moore. And also we have Greg Wilkinson, who's Vice President of Public and Government Affairs at Nova Chemicals. Thank you. I am also not a lawyer, and uh, I work for a smallish company. I am not an expert in any of these areas, and in fact, I'm not engaged in most of these areas every day. I think of myself as the customer for these processes. So uh, this has been an interesting exercise for me to, to ponder how this system works for us um, or against us and how we influence it and uh, how we engage in the, the process. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. Um, my topic is on international data privacy and the disharmonies in managing international data privacy, particularly between the United States and Canada. Um, 
it's an issue, I think, that disharmony is driven uh, as much by misunderstandings by lawyers as is actual differences in the law. And the problem that's created is we now have a greater disharmony in uh, managing multinationals between the United States and Canada than we do between either the United States and Europe or Canada and Europe. So we have North Americans now resisting doing trade and benefiting Europe because of the way that we manage data security. Um, data safety is a microphone. Oh, yes. Excuse me. Is that better? Um, the way that different states manage data security in the world really breaks down into two categories. The majority view is the, the manner followed by Europe and Canada, which tends to view data privacy as a human right. So they um, tend to regulate it broadly and usually with national laws. The United States is probably the minority in the way that they regulate that. And, um, conceptually, the Americans don't view it as a right but regulate more instances of data security considerations so that if there's an area where there's a concern that data privacy is issued being regulated, they'll focus on the areas where there may be a breach, but they won't focus on the broader issue of how data privacy works across the nations. Um, in regulating, managing data privacy, obviously this is an important issue. We all know that we want our personal data, particularly our employment data, being protected. But it's developed differently. Europe was really the leader, starting after World War II. A few of the states, particularly France and Germany, though perhaps for different reasons, um, enacted very stringent uh, data security laws. Those have developed into the European Union approach. And the European Union has um, data security laws that apply throughout all of the member states. So that for purposes of, of my interest in managing personal data or data of employees across borders, Europe has a very good situation because if you're a member state, um, member states, companies in a me countries in a companies or employers in a member state are able to share information in other member states because they all have to comply with the same data security laws. Now Europe's looked around the world to see if there are companies that also meet their standard, and very few countries have met their standard. Two countries that have are Canada and Argentina. But companies, countries such as the United States, Australia, and China, major partners with Europe don't meet this. So that's become, and originally, that was a disharmony. It was a harmony between Canada and Europe, but a disharmony for the rest. Um, the way that was dealt with in the U.S., obviously the U.S. and Europe have to continue to do business. So uh, businesses and governments found two ways to accommodate uh, the need to continue to do business. Uh, one is for employers, multinational employers such as my company, can apply for safe harbor status with the Department of Commerce. The European um, community and the, the Department of Commerce have worked out a set of rules that companies can certify to. And once we've met these and get the certification, we're issued the certificate from the Department of Commerce Compliance is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission so that a multinational now has the ability to manage data across boundaries. This means, for example, a large company can house some of and access some of its employee data, pension data, group health data, benefits data in the United States. They can have common servers and they can operate as a true multinational. Um, Canada hasn't had to do that because they were recognized as meeting the European standard, probably because with the Papilla pipe uh, uh, statute in 2001 that was applied to corporations in 2004. Um, the more central regulation satisfied European concerns. The problem with that is those of us who work in the multinational environment find it now very easy to work with Europeans and harder to work in Canada. In Canada. Europeans, even aside from the safe harbor status, European community recognized that if a member state is dealing with a country that's not certified, they can have out-of-state transfers as long as they have contractual protections. Contractual protections such as assurances of um, adequate preparations are made, definition and specification of what those are. You know, what is the user, what's the contractor doing with security, uh, is recryption acquired, are backup media destroyed or managed on a reasonable basis and such. So we also have commercial parties that have figured out how to do business. This should also apply between the U.S. and Canada, but it hasn't. And it hasn't, in my view, uh, largely because of perceptions of legal barriers that in some cases don't exist, or where they do exist, they have been exaggerated. 
Originally, I think the perception was that Canada was ahead of the United States in privacy regulation. And I believe at first they substantively were. In 2001, um, the federal government passed the PEPITA statute, which is Canada, was Canada's first national regulation of private health information in Canada. And it controlled all private information. You know, the companies had to take adequate steps to protect people's names, when it was linked to where they live, how much they made, and other identifying numbers. This was expanded in 2004, so it covers all public companies or all uh, private entities, which could be public or private companies, unless the province has come up with a more expansive law. And in a few provinces, we have seen this. Uh, two examples are in British Columbia, by statute, government agencies are not allowed to transfer data outside of Canada. Again, that only affects governments and may have the effect of requiring the British Columbia government to insource all of its, its uh, data security rather than use outsourced, um, some of which may be fairly sophisticated. The other exception is Nova Scotia, which has passed a law requiring that all data be kept in Canada. Um, and in terms of cross-border uh, restrictions, this is the only province that has this. And I'm not sure that's the model we want to follow because I think as a practical matter, when multinationals or employers looking to maintain or expand operations in Canada are looking to where the highest or lowest burdens are, they are going to notice that if they have operations in Nova Scotia, they have to set up a several administrative facility. They can't manage their pension plans um, outside of Nova Scotia. And uh, quite frankly, I think many that's, that's going to limit the attractiveness of Nova Scotia. Essentially, they've walled themselves off. Now, I've said Canada, I think, led the way, but the Americans did follow in the usual way. They've sort of carved out little spaces where they thought data security needed to be followed, first federally, and then uh, with a variety of states becoming sort of the tail that wags the dog in security. But in the end, I think they've come, um, they've come up with restrictions that meet and probably exceed what's going on in Canada. Um, the first real health res uh, regulation that we had was HIPAA. The health insurance and uh, the health insurance portability and protecting act of 1994. It recently became enacted. Uh, it didn't have a lot of power for the first years, but it really took off in January 2009 with something called the High Tech Law. The High Tech Law has expanded the reach of HIPAA not only to uh, the vendors, the healthcare providers itself, but also to all the service providers, and it's added some very aggressive disclosure requirements. So, if, for example, you're a contractor for a health care provider or your health care provider a hospital and you have a data leak, you immediately have to take a number of steps within no later than 60 days, including a full audit of the process and notices. And the notices ramp up pretty severely. I think if it's a small breach, you have to do a quick audit, notify management, uh, the general counsel, the board of directors, and everyone whose data is compromised. If it's a group of more than 100 employees, you've also got, you also have to notify the Department of Labor and you have to alert the media. So if you find you've breached um, uh, data, you have to put out news reports. Um, another um, new development of the high tech law is state attorney generals now have the authority to enforce federal law. So the recent case that we had, example of this we have, was a data breach last week in a Connecticut hospital. A Connecticut hospital suffered the bane of any employer. They had a disgruntled former employee who was a radiologist who um, somehow had passwords of some of his coworkers. He used the passwords to go in and take, of all things, pictures he'd taken, basically x-rays. But this is personal information covered. So they had to make the disclosure. So they published it. They made the disclosure. They alerted the media. I've looked at their website, and in all respects, it looks like they've done everything required on high tech. The day after they posted the notice, the Attorney General of uh, the State of Connecticut announced that he would be suing them. So uh, enforcement is pretty, uh, pretty active. Now that only covers, again, the small slice. That's only health information. So the states have kind of come in in their own way to fill the gap. The first state to try to expand uh, coverage was California, which had requirements that essentially erase Social Security numbers in conjunction with uh, uh, names. So basically anybody doing business in the United States had to come up with new identifiers and get rid of Social Security numbers. Um, now uh, Massachusetts has gone even further. So that any company with operations in Massachusetts now has um, requirements that meet and exceed uh, um, probably the scope of uh, PIPEDA. <coughs> the divergence that we really see in, uh, in contracting are really twofold. Um, one is, are there contractual impediments? Well, there really aren't. Because with the exception of Nova Scotia, PIPEDA doesn't 
restrict contracting. It does require contracting and the kind of protections that we see in Europe. Common sense protections to be sure that your vendors and everyone who's working with the data is taking adequate protection. The uh, objection that Americans hear the most from Canada is the concern that the Pat U.S. Patriot Act will come into force if Canadian data is either managed in the U.S. or managed in Canada in the subsidiary of a U.S. company. This is interesting to us because I think it's the wrong argument, but it makes there is a point underlying this that's worth considering. It's the wrong argument because, quite frankly, the scope of uh, the U.S. Patriot Act is so unwieldy that if the U.S. government really is interested in Canadian data, I don't think they're going to be using it. Um, the ACLU has, uh, with FOIA requests, obtained a lot of information on how the U.S. Patriot Act has been used since 2001. Um, first, it is a judicial system. There is a court. There is an appellate court. So it's not a government just taking information, which was probably the norm, particularly in Europe, uh, at least 10 or more years ago. Uh, but second, there have only been 35 cases in which it's been granted. And as the ACL looked at this, the government seems to be following the procedure. They can only um, obtain data of foreign nationals when it is uh, part of a, a broader articulated foreign security investigation. And it has to has a direct bearing on that. Moreover, if one was trying to uh, um, use this to obtain data in Canada, there would be other impediments because as a foreign national, and since it would be information obtained in the part of a criminal investigation, the custodian of the data would have very robust defenses. So um, it's not particularly efficient. It would have no legal right to get data that's not directly under uh, the jurisdiction of, of security. And quite frankly, if, if the FBI wants the information, we'll just get on the phone and look hard at the RCMP. So that's really not where the threat is. But it suggests a different issue, which is the U.S. government does take the position that if you're a U.S. company, they have the jurisdiction over the affiliates in, um, in enforcing law enforcement subpoenas. Um, and they take this position even if the information to be disclosed is personal. And disclosing that would violate the laws of the custodial state. The most recent example we saw of this was the IRS proceedings in Switzerland involving UBS, the bank. Um, the request of the IRS would violate Swiss uh, law, and the American company, in that, I'm sorry, the Swiss company, but the American affiliate was in the position that they were being told by the U.S. government, you have a choice, either break our law or your law. Um, governments have not really talked to each other how to resolve this problem, and this is a bigger problem in data security, because the same problem exists throughout Europe, and it's at least a theoretical problem in um, relations between the United States and Canada. I don't think in the context so much as the U.S. Patriot Act, but it is in potential enforcement actions by the IRS, the SEC, or the Justice Department. Um, just to sort of wrap up, my concern is in terms of data exchanges between the U.S. and Canada, there are a lot of harmonies and we've got the same place. But there are disharmonies, some of which can be managed by lawyers and companies, and some of which should be considered by companies. In terms of lawyers working with data security, I think it's important um, that they know the subject matter. Know whether or not um, the transfer is prohibited, and more to the point, know how to practically manage that. What are the technical issues that have to be addressed? And in terms of governments, I think all of us in the multinational world think it's high time for governments to start talking to each other about enforcing their laws on information kept outside of their jurisdiction. Uh, this could be done through amending PEPIDA, it could be done through direct communications, but I think it's a problem that transcends Canada and really um, affects relations between the United States in particular and all of its partners. Um, that's my sort of overview of the, the privacy issue. Uh, before we move on, does anyone have any questions? Yes? We hear the panelists. Excuse me? Can we hear the panelists? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Do the panelists have any questions? Not so much a question, but an observation. You talked about the, uh, the issue of coordination among governments, and I can say from an example, uh, <clears throat> there's, there's another place where I found disharmony there, in uh, similar to what you're describing, in export control law, where, for instance, in the United States, the law here that bars U.S. companies and their affiliates wherever located from trading in Cuba. Uh, Canada 
has a law, and the European Union has a law, that says if you're a subsidiary of a U.S. parent and you decide to listen to your parent and not sell to Cuba, you violate the law of Canada or of Europe. Um, and so there's situations like that that most of the time we talk about convergence and harmony and we're just going to continue to do that. But, uh, but there's other areas where this same phenomenon of, of getting sort of in a catch-22 uh, is out there and usually driven by political considerations. Right. Oh, I think that what you have described are things that are a bit over my head and technically, uh, but I think that uh, we would just send it to the lawyer and say, well, do we have a problem? Hmm. Uh, I have absolutely no way of understanding some of these uh, issues that, uh, that we, we are facing. Yeah. I think our concern is the lawyers who are getting the question what the problem is is that there's no real answer, there's no cure for some of these issues that are being asked. I'm afraid I'd take the same approach as Dr. Funk. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. That's, that's the lawyers know how to talk, and the other ones know how to take a fifth another approach. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Dr. Funk, would you like to mean your presentation? Thank you. As I said, that I'm not a lawyer, so you'll find that there's very little that uh, I, I'm only being confused by all the legal arguments. Uh, and uh, so I need to spend more money on lawyers. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Now, how do I... Oh, oh I just advanced it on the computer, right. Okay, I, I pressed the wrong button. Well, it's the engineers uh, their needs always need help. Uh, I, I don't read my slides, and, and then you can usually read it within five seconds. So that's uh, roughly what I, I plan to talk to you about. Uh, the issues on how businesses are running away from the legal framework that's being set up around the world. And that's what we do. Uh, we are risk seekers. We, if there's no risk, we're not interested because there's no money in it. But we're not risk takers. So we seek risk, but then we go out and try to manage it and parcel out the, the risk. Uh, in the process, our objective, of course, is to make money and make a society a little bit better. To be innovators, we have to learn to fail frequently and fail fast. The worst thing to do is to get a project to 99% and then have to cut the losses. So we survive by failing fast. And so these are different projects that we work on. Again, I, uh, I think it's not important about that. But I want to show you, see all the flags of our businesses. Uh, none of them have a single flag. And I would like to ask you the question as lawyers, what do you do to deal with my product? When I take a piece of lumber from Canada that costs one dollar if I sell it, but I don't sell it, I ship it to China, and they cut it up and make it finger joint panels. Now the value has gone to five dollars. But then I don't sell it either. I now ship it to Germany, in which well now I want to make them into panels for the kitchens and for the the, the study. Now the value is forty dollars. So, what product is that? Is that a product of Germany when it gets into the consumer's hand because now it's being finalized in Germany? Is it a product of China because it came from China as a finger joint panel? Or is it a product of Canada because the wood originated from Canada and is managed by a Canadian company? So, I don't really quite know how trade lawyers deal with these issues. Again, this is a business that has no employees and no offices. So the products are coming from Europe and from China, coming into the United States, and we are one of the first companies that caused Export Development Canada to change its rules on ensuring our U.S. receivables based on Canadian content when we told them we have zero Canadian content. 
but we create substantial Canadian benefit because we're using the port of Canada, we are using the railways, and we're using the lawyers and the bankers, and when I make obscene profits, I pay taxes in Canada. We talk a little bit about today, about the issue of heavy oil, uh, 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 oil sand. And, and, and I heard about legislations trying to deal with the high carbon footprint of oil, oil sands. Those are things that we love to hear because it creates new risk. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to take all the beetle kill wood in, in British Columbia, turn them into wood pallets, and we'll ship them up to Fort McMurray and we'll turn the oil sand oil, the greenest oil in the, in the world. Because there'll be no carbon emission at all using wood as the fuel to refine. So, so those are the kind of things that we love legislators creating new rules because we then go make more money. Here's wood. That is, again, I mentioned earlier on. In North America, when we harvest hardwood, our yield is 15%, one five. You cannot find any industry that's more wasteful than our North American hardwood industry. So what do we do? We take what's being discarded, all those little short logs that you see in the picture, well, we ship it to China and they turn them in furniture and they bring it back into the United States. Now, is that a product of China? When in fact, the only component the Chinese put in is the labor cost, which is insignificant. This is North American wood. And if we need to set aside NAFTA's rule, then I don't ship it into the United States, I ship it back to Canada, do the final bit of assembly, and I satisfy now all the North American content, and the final assembly, and this is a North American and NAFTA furniture. So we decided that we're going to go into fish farming and shrimp farming. And here are the technologies that we are putting into place that would make it completely sustainable. No wastewater, no waste discharge. It's a complete ecological cycle. But I'm not going to tell you about it because it's too early. I don't want anybody else to copy us. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> Manufacturing about creating value. In Canada, we suffered as much as anybody else during this past recession. But more, more importantly, we had to look at North America together that the yellow line that you can barely see on the picture is the Chinese import into the United States. <coughs> the import of Chinese products surpassed Canada, and you can see that it's ticking off. Canada is no longer even in the picture of competing with China in shipping goods into the United States. We had NAFTA. We have all done pretty well with NAFTA. They look at China. They've done even better without NAFTA. China is rising rapidly. They're graduating half a million graduates in technical technology. Even assuming half of them are no good, then don't look at the yellow line but the blue line. Like blue line, we're still in trouble competing with the Chinese on technical and sciences. And we think they have been stealing our technology. Then you look at the issue of China having more PhD graduated than the United States. Pretty soon we need to learn to steal their technology. <laughs> Auto market, they've surpassed our market. North Asia is now the center of auto production. And they do this using a lot of containers. If the United States imposed a duty on parts being imported into the United States from China, one of the major casualties would be the assembly plants of Caterpillar. Because they will become uncompetitive going to the global market. And the Chinese will not be hurt because the beneficiary of that legislation would be Commerce of Japan who would take over the global market from Caterpillar and buy more Chinese parts. So bilateral trade is an obsolete concept. <coughs> Apple iPod, the Chinese got $4. 
for assembling it. The iPad, they got $12 assembling it. Is it a product of China? And in the street statistics, we show it's $120 to $150 an iPod coming into the United States. It's $250 uh, an iPad coming to the United States when China only added four dollars and added five dollars in the case of uh, twelve dollars in the case of iPad. Apple in California collects sixty bucks for the iPod and hundred twenty bucks for the iPad. So all that money that we said we had a, a trade deficit with China actually comes right back into California, except just through the Chinese. <coughs> Air is becoming a major component of trade. <clears throat> Victoria's Secret now pick up more market share by using air cargo instead of by marine. And yet in North America, our air cargo terminals are not keeping up. So the Asians have taken over. Fuel costs, somebody said, would have impact on this globalization, you look at the freight component, it's irrelevant. Fuel costs can go up by another double or triple, who cares? All the most wealthy nations in the world are trading nations. This is because the scope of manufacturing has changed. Our statistics based on the blue portion is obsolete. The value is actually in the yellow portion. We don't need to touch the product in order to capture the value. It is creating and delivering value, not fabrication. So flexibility, agility becomes very important on a global basis. Innovation, global. We have to have innovative business models in order to stay to win. We're not here to compete with China, China or India. We're here to manage. China, India. I cannot compete with against 40 Chinese engineers, but I can manage 400 and I can manage 4,000. And this is the kind of business model we are dealing with. So, and these are some of the winners, small little companies, by capturing the ability to go global, by instead of fishing themselves, highliner high, high uh, uh, decided they are going to buy from everybody, everybody else who are fishing. Probably changing the customer mix. Bombardier became a world's largest train uh, manufacturer by buying up uh, a German company at the right time. In North America, we have the right people with the right stuff to capture those values. And yet, we are dismal in terms of our view of the world. We stayed too and close in introspect within North America. We create regulatory barriers to make ourselves even less competitive. Again, I think that you're all familiar with some of these issues that we could, if we want to, take out all these little minor components and make ourselves a more integrated economy so that we would be more competitive on a world basis. And I'm not going to go into the details because my panelists are, uh, are much more able to deal with each of these individual elements. But one way we've been emerging is that as I'm on the board of the CSA group, instead of waiting for government to create harmonized regulations, con regulatory con uh, convergence, CSA, UL, these certification bodies are starting to take over. As I mentioned early on, and if you look at an iPod and iPad, there are so many different components in it. You cannot assign them to any one nation. You can, it's difficult to assign their origin, but through certification bodies, we can actually protect the public and allow us to become more competitive. I think, it was, I think Maureen this morning has covered this very adequately. I don't need to talk about that. But why have we not done more? Sometimes, I think we try too much. I think sometimes we have vested interests who want to stop us from harmonizing our regulations.
So maybe it's time for us to move forward with more limited scope as we try to make North America more competitive. So I want to just set the scene to say that globally in business, we are not looking towards legislators to help us because they are bogged down in all these details and yet the world's not waiting for us. Asia is moving forward and if we don't go and manage Asia, there will be no North America. We need to collaborate if we're going to survive and prosper. So it is important that we do not allow regulations to use up the scarce resources that we have. And as business leaders and legislators, we must understand that if we do not embrace global innovations, integration, and with regulatory convergence, we are not going to win. So I hope that we'll work together and create the competitive environment that we would win in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Associations are not developing. In the past, we, they all started out within one country. Now they recognize that the business has changed. So, so UL has become international. Uh, 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 CG, uh, um, uh, CSA has become international. Uh, today, every gas barbecue, gas appliances in North America are now certified by CSA. Uh, UL focus on electrical components. And, the U and CSA now expanded into Europe and into China. So in many ways, these standard associations are moving forward by not telling government what to do, but adapting what the different governments are doing and create a common framework so that you and I can now have some place to go to in order for that product to be accepted in a different country around the world. And CSA is moving into Europe because they understand that if CSA is not in Europe, then their standard, their brand, will not be good enough. You have to have one brand that can go right across the whole world. Thank you. I have a few observations, uh, Dr. Fung, just from the world as I see it, working for a multinational. Is, um, and, and a point I think that the government regulatory agencies need to consider is how nimble companies are in the face of regulation. I think on the one hand, companies are very fast, as, as you said, some companies will always move into an area of regulatory pressure. As you know, you discussed doing in response to environmental issues, we also see this. In my company, we will probably be a big beneficiary of the healthcare legislation, because we do healthcare uh, regulation. But the flip side of that, as we see with our, our multinational clients, is that if regulators put up too many barriers, it's very easy. Companies have become more nimble. And it's easier than ever for companies to avoid uh, jurisdictions and become too burdensome, and, and we do see that. So. I think regulations have the tendency to create inefficiencies, uh, and if we want the market to really allocate resources properly, so we have to have very intelligent regulations. Because if we are clever, if we are going to maintain the prosperity of North America, our regulations should be helping our industry. To become more competitive, not the other way around. And in order to do that, I'm very concerned that our politicians may not fully understand, have been educated to understand how international businesses actually is working. And in the process, go and develop regulations that will be counterproductive and create unintended consequences. And that's a major, major concern. I hope your profession, because most of the legislators are lawyers, I hope your profession will be able to help more legislators to understand how regulations can help us with our prosperity and not the other way around. Thank you. Do we have any, any questions from the audience at this time? Okay, well thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, Tim Boyle from Eaton.
one without all the fancy flags. Um, I was doing this while on the road. Uh, just to follow up on what Dave was saying, I, there's a, this concept of standard setting. I wasn't going to speak about it, but it's very relevant. Uh, it's not just you know, uh, underwriters' laboratories and people who, who create safety standards, but it's really very, very plentiful and increasingly growing throughout the world, and it's not just limited to the U.S. and Canada at all. Uh, and the laws, and I'm going to talk a bit about competition law, and, and competition law has evolved to embrace that kind of activity. It's the reason that here in Canada you can plug something into the wall, and it works in both countries. There's a standard for that, and what it allows is a platform for competition among rivals, but it's, it's based on a platform that's common and established, in, the, in this case, by the rivals themselves. The rules of engagement in that area have evolved as well and are pretty consistent within the United States, Canada, Europe, and even to a large extent Asia. Um, and so there's all kinds of things that have been incentivizing people to do that, and I think it's a, a great way to avoid those regulatory costs and unintended consequences that are quite common, unfortunately, with regulation. As I said before, I'm going to talk about competition issues. There have been some big changes in Canada in the past uh, 12 months. Um, and uh, also I'm going to talk a little bit about anti-bribery. There's some things going on in Canada there that's quite interesting, actually. And a little bit of the end on securities law, um, which is what I just said, so I'll move on. Um, in 2009, Canada passed the Budget Implementation Act. And part of it went into effect right away, and part of it just went into effect last, this past March. Um, basically, it brought um, a number of things Canadian into sync with what the U.S. does, um, and, uh, and to a certain extent, parts of the world. Um, criminalizing criminalizing antitrust violations is something that's not done across the board. There's about 11 countries, I think maybe 12, that have criminalized uh, cartel behavior, conspiracies to fix prices, bid rig, or allocate markets. Um, the Canadians uh, have criminalized antitrust for some time, and uh, what they've done in, in addition is what they've decided is now in a civil case, it's just going to be illegal. You know, no questions asked. There's no justification for a price fix or a market allocation, which before you had to prove an effect. And that's, uh, it really changes the way people litigate. And so it's, uh, that's one change that went into effect with that. And that particular one just went into effect uh, this past March. Um, other horizontal agreements, agreements between competitors, like the standard setting I was talking about. Rivals get together to decide, um, you know, California has a, a gasoline grade that's unique to California called car gasoline. And the, the makers of petroleum products got together with the California Air Resources Board and de decided what that was going to be. That kind of uh, horizontal agreement isn't illegal, it's not like price fixing. Um, and those kinds of agreements can still be challenged. They can, they can be illegal, in fact. And in, in, that con in that context, Canada recently changed its, uh, its standard to, to fit exactly what the U.S. standard is of uh, substantial lessening of competition. And it did two other things in repealing criminalization of certain types of conduct. And these were unique areas. Canada is the only country in the world that made these things criminal. Um, and, uh, and much of the world is looking at them quite differently, and I'll explain what they mean in a minute. Price discrimination is, if you're selling a product, let's say you make bicycles, and you're going to sell bicycles to a Walmart, you're going to sell bicycles to uh, small um, sporting goods stores. Do they get the same price? Because price discrimination is selling to those, those two different buyers, the big one and the little one, at different prices, under certain circumstances, it's fairly technical, uh, can be illegal. In Canada, it could be criminal. Now, the United States hasn't brought a price discrimination, discrimination case since about 1980, and that's because economists actually think it's more output enhancing to do this than to not do it. Uh, Singapore, in 2006, passed a comprehensive competition law and didn't put price discrimination in it, following on the Australians, who actually wrote it out of their laws in around 1990. And so, criminalizing it, there hadn't been criminal cases brought in this in any, in any recent past. But it was, a, to, to the rest of the world, to antitrust lawyers, that seemed like a very strange thing. You know, I was in Washington this week in, um, in a meeting about an antitrust issue, and uh, I heard somebody say that, uh, well, this antitrust issue just isn't sexy. And I explained that that's, that's, that's not true. It's really the fact that antitrust lawyers just have lower standards. <laughs> so the other thing uh, is resale price thing. 
sense. When you go into a store and you see a manufacturer's suggested price on something, the reason you see that is because in this country, starting in 1911, it was illegal to require your reseller to not go below a certain price. You could suggest it, you could cajole them, you could inspire them, but you couldn't make them. And um, last, two years ago, the United States federal law changed. The Supreme Court flipped that around and reversed its earlier uh, precedent. Canada was the only country making that kind of behavior criminal behavior. That, too, is out now. It's just a civil, a civil violation. The rest of the world has not followed the United States on that, this issue. And it remains illegal everywhere else, uh, every industrialized country that has any trust law, which is most of them. Um, so, uh, and also, they allowed a private cause of action. That's a little unusual. If you get leave, you can get, bring a private cause of action before the competition tri tribunal for this, which here before that was not available. And the last thing they've done in this uh, law is they've shortened the merger wait waiting period, which actually is a big deal. Because if you have a deal, you know, my company does business in about 175 countries, you have filings in Germany, you have filings in Austria, Brazil, China, and you want to close your deal. And if you don't have, you have disharmony in these waiting periods, lots of things happen. You lose employees, you, you uh, have, incur all kinds of costs, you miss opportunities to integrate and, and create value. And so bringing these things into sync is, is actually a pretty significant thing. Um, I'm going to move on to corruption now. Uh, Canada has a law that's a lot like the United States Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. What that does is it makes it illegal for companies in Canada or in the United States to bribe foreign officials, say in China. And it violates the law of Canada or the law of the United States when you do that. Canada signed on in 1997 to the OECD Convention on Combating Bribery and passed that law in, in, in the spirit of that. Uh, the, the difference between Canada and the United States, and for those of you who don't know it, this is the, one of the hottest button issues in the U.S. Justice Department. Growth is two to three, four times per year the number of enforcement actions that are bringing. You probably read about Siemens, and it's more than a billion dollar fine from the US, United States government. And uh, British Aerospace, just a few, about a month ago, uh, got fined, I think it was about $400 million by the US and about 50 to 100 million uh, equivalent US dollars by Britain. So the US fines are actually are much bigger than the ones that they got from their own government. Well, uh, Transparency International, which is a, an organization that keeps track of a lot of, of, a lot of this stuff, uh, has been critical of, of Canada. And that's because Canada has a requirement in its current law that there be an impact back on Canada from that bribe in China by the Canadian affiliate of a, or affiliate of a Canadian company. Well, that has a big effect because most of the time it's not going to have an effect back home. And th this law has been a bit of a paper tiger. And uh, there's a bill now before Parliament to change that and bring it right into the with what the FCPA is moving. That's important because in, a, in many respects, the U.S. has been out in front of this issue. Um, you know, until 1995 in Germany, you could write off as a business expense your bribes. Uh, you know, the world is changing. It's changing at a very fast clip. And there's lots of places in the world where it's so common just to do ordinary things, to import a product or to get a passport, and you have to put money in somebody's pocket. They pay the people, the government officials, so low, they expect them to make up, um, make up some money on the side. And uh, that, that will change if more than the United States is out there reaching beyond its borders to, uh, to deal with this kind of behavior. Lastly, uh, the securities laws in the two countries actually are fairly similar, and uh, there's, there's a, but, but the, the model we use is very dissimilar. In Canada, it's controlled by the provinces. And the, the provinces have an umbrella organization called the Canadian Securities Administration that tends to, to try to smooth over those edges and have consistency. And it's done a quite a good job that way. But now there's a, a parliament has uh, passed legislation to establish a Canadian securities regulatory regime and over the next three years. And they're drafting the Securities Act, which is going to be vetted and it's going to become a federal law. Um, the, CSA, the, the umbrella organization I just described, uh, it has had uh, a number of components adopted that very, are very much similar to U.S. Sarbanes-Oxley law, uh, including auditor oversight, the fact that the CEO and the CFO have to certify that these, these financials are correct, 
um, a national, uh, national Instrument on Audit Committees as well. There's some standards for audit committees that are, have been pushed out through this that are very similar to the United States. And uh, Canada and U.S. securities regulatory authorities have implemented uh, a multi-jurisdictional disclosure system that enables large U.S. issuers to be offered to Canadians uh, using only the U.S. registration statement. So it's a facilitation of, of uh, getting U.S. securities into the hands of, uh, of Canadians. All those things have been done with the provincial level, but now with the federal level coming in, it will be to be seen. And I think it's not controversial in the sense of uh, a structural change. It, it remains to be seen what changes will occur when there's one authority. So that's all I have. If, uh, any questions? Yeah, Tim. Um, on the antitrust uh, theory, I recall, um, I haven't looked at the antitrust law in Canada recently, but I recall in the past that although it looked structurally like the Sherman Act, uh, it contained, it had a different sort of enforcement field. The Canadian enforcement model was more of a model to protect internal competition or international competitiveness rather than police internal business. A good example of that was I think the Canadian Tire Exemption actually written into the statute. Is there a different emphasis now in enforcement? Um, I, I don't think I would go as far as you, you went with that in terms of the general characterization of it. Um, I do think there's a, you know, Canada being a relatively smaller country, and you see this all the time, you know, you think you need to to uh, nurture your own, to get scale, to be competitive in order to be a low-cost producer or provider of whatever it is you're selling. Um, and so there's been in, in Canada perhaps on what I might call unilateral conduct, the, you know, monopolization, to put it in, in American parlance, um, less of a, of a focus. The, the thresholds on mergers to be reviewed are quite a bit higher. I mean, in my 20-something years of practice, uh, I've never had a filing in Canada. Uh, I've been everywhere else, it seems. But um, I don't think that the enforcement, the difference in enforcement in Canada really is driven more by the fact that it's government-driven enforcement. In the United States, the Department of Justice and the FTC and the 50 states enforce this, these laws. But you can bring a claim as a private party challenging much, almost all this stuff. It depends on what the nature of the claim is, whether you have standing or not. But, but by and large, a, a rival can challenge its rival. A customer can sue its, its uh, a supplier. Uh, and so you don't have as much of that in Canada. That's the really big difference. Yes? Um, comments as much as questions. Um, I'm a security side. You may be aware that there's a movement afoot that will be in place a single securities regulator. And that will then impact our relationship with the U.S. and I think will be very beneficial to yes. Canada and U.S. Uh, trade. And the multi-jurisdictional -juris disclosure, or whatever it's called, or others in the room probably look to Michael that are much better with these acronyms. It's been a real boon, I think, to the business community because it was such a nuisance that not only did you have 10 provinces you had to do with, you had to then deal with the United States. And the cost, which adds no real benefit to right. the productivity of the um, industry or the company, was extraordinary. And so I think in that sense, it's been very positive. On the competition law side, um, I wonder if you can comment on the following. And I think the initiatives you highlighted are quite significant because I, having been engaged in cross-border trade, those issues do come up all the time. People shake their head. Why do we have one set of rules in the US and one set of rules in Canada? But my understanding is that the Canadian legislation, the new legislation, now is much closer to what the Hart Scott Rubino uh, legislation in the United States. But that Hart Scott Rodino is out of sync with the rest of the world. And when you step back, uh, it's interesting to think that Canada adopted a more US-centric approach as opposed to taking the approach uh, being followed by the EU or other parts of the world. And I wonder whether you wanted to sure. comment on that and what your experiences have been. And I did introduce myself. My name is Donna Luxemburg, um, and uh, I'm from Toronto. Great. Uh, just let me put Hart Scott Rodino on into a nomenclature will all understand who uh, are native trust lawyers. We're talking about the rules if you want to do a merger, reporting to the government, telling the government about the merger, and letting the government take it, uh, in, the, in the case of the United States, go into court to stop it, or in the case of every other country on the planet, approve or disapprove the merger. Um, and so there have been some changes on the thresholds, I mean, sorry, not on the thresholds, but on the waiting period that I mentioned. There haven't been changes on the threshold. The threshold is still pretty high. And so most deals that might get reported in, in what I'll call the, the uh, 
hair trigger jurisdictions of Germany or Austria or Brazil or China um, don't end up getting reported in Canada at all, even if there are Canadian assets in, engaged in the deal, um, because their thresholds are just higher. Uh, the Hart Scott issue you're, you're mentioning about being out of sync, actually, there's a lot of things going on right now. Justice Carl Shapiro is the chief economist, and he's going to try to rewrite the, the DOJ merger guidelines. Because what's going on in the way US, the U.S. has enforced the antitrust law is the thinking has evolved. This is all about industrial organization economics. It's all about how firms make pricing and output decisions. And in that sense, it's really important because it, you know, firms make lots of pricing and output decisions and we're all consumers. Um, there, what's happened is that the, the, the way the, the guidelines have been operating, with the way they're written, the way they've been enforced are different and perhaps more giving, letting things, letting activities go on, letting the mergers occur that might have been into thresholds that were in these guidelines that would have created a question whether they should have or shouldn't have. Um, and so I think that the, the changes in the Canadian antitrust law vis-a-vis -vis merger review really don't go to that content. They don't go to the content. They, this is really less about what's in the statute than how the the policy of the government in choosing to intervene and stop two companies from uh, merging, whether they do it or they don't. Um, and so in that sense, I don't think it's out of sync. In fact, I will tell you that the things I've been saying about U.S. and Canada are really on a much broader scale than that. I mean, 10 years ago, government started talking in this area. And every single day, there are conversations between the U.S. agencies in Europe and all these other countries I'm talking about. Um, and, and the amount of convergence in this area is, is significant. There's organizations like the OECD, there's an international competition network of the governments that meets regularly and tries to bring convergence, tries to avoid the, the GE Honeywell situation that we experienced 10 years ago or whatever it was. Um, and, and so there's actually more and more convergence occurring. I've highlighted a couple of differences, but really it's uh, this real story here is it's getting more the same. And that's important because just like underlying commercial law, you want to be able to do a transaction and have you know, some semblance of reality in, in country B that you bring from country A. And the same thing's true with competition. If you want a pricing policy uh, with your distributors, you, know, you, you want to be able to have a single platform if you can that would you know, pass muster in all these different countries. Okay, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, we're running a little short on time, and, and I apologize as the moderator. I haven't been doing a very good job. <clears throat> Our last speaker is, is Greg Wilkinson, and uh, he, we'd like to ask, um, um, we'd like your indulgence to stay and listen and not punish him for uh, the rest of us, particularly us, us over bureaus lawyers, for running on. But uh, um, how much you indulgence have, do we have? How much indulgence do we have? He'd like to ask. Um, it's easier to ask yeah, for 15, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Everyone else was scheduled for 15 minutes. So the, uh, the highly compressed version is uh, standing between the group and lunch. I know it's uh, probably Would you use the microphone? I'll aim it toward me. How's that? Hey. All right. Okay, I, I will take a moment to introduce uh, my company because that's probably helpful. Uh, we are smallish, certainly compared to the, uh, the big global companies, 2,500 employees, but we make a lot of product. We uh, make 10 billion pounds of product every year and uh, ship it across the border in large volumes. 20,000 uh, shipments a year, rail cars mostly, so uh, large shipments, large volumes, border important to us, uh, regulatory harmonization clearly important. And I, I want to talk about uh, our performance in terms of the environment uh, because uh, I think it's what earns us uh, a seat at the table. We are the good guys. Uh, we produce things that are important to people, uh, save energy, package medicines, and we do it in an extremely responsible way. This graphic uh, shows something that's uh, described by the, uh, the process control folks as uh, loss of process control. What that means is uh, the people at the plant say it's keeping stuff in the pipes. And uh, responsible care is uh, this global ethic that uh, uh, started in Canada and was adopted immediately by the, the U.S., uh, now practiced in 50 countries around the world, and it drives performance improvement like this. So, as a result, we think we deserve to have a, a seat at the table. 
yes, I'm Canadian, so there has to be a hockey slide. Uh, but notice that it is Canada and the, the U.S., and I will also not mention that gold medal winning goal. Oh. <laughs> competition is a, a good thing. Competition between Canada and the U.S. is uh, clearly a healthy thing and uh, exists on, on many planes. Uh, however, I, I love the comment that uh, the, the chap from Detroit made last night that we make things together. Our supply chains are, are so integrated that we can't let that competition get in the way of the principle of us harmonizing our regulations so that we can compete with, as uh, Dr. Fung was, was saying, with, with others. Uh, this is uh, for polyethylene, which is the major product that we manufacture. Uh, there are 70 million tons of polyethylene traded around the world uh, every year. Uh, the size of the arrows indicates the, uh, the volume of the, the trade. And you can see from North America, uh, lots of outbound arrows. 20% of the, the volume of the product that's produced in North America gets sold elsewhere. And uh, you can see arrows going to the Pacific Rim, to China. We've been very active in that market for uh, uh, over 25 years, as are other North American producers. But also, if you look at the arrow that, that heads from the Middle East to China, it's a much bigger arrow. So yes, we compete with the other North American producers, but the real competitor, the low-cost competitor, is the, the Middle East. So again, we make things together that we sell to other folks. Anybody know what this is? Anybody care to guess what this is? Anybody care what this is? Accelerator <laughs> and Toyota. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, uh, does the name uh, Ed Deming mean anything to anyone? Sure. Quality guru from, from the 80s and 90s. So this uh, was a tool that Mr. Deming used in his seminars. It's called the Red Bead Experiment. And it, it works like this. Uh, bucket, 4,000 beads, 20% of them red. And uh, the participant comes and you put a blindfold on them. They take this paddle, they shove the paddle in, pull it out, and then they're told the red ones are contaminants. So reduce the red ones. Okay, I understand the rules now. You put the blindfold back on, you shove the, the paddle in, you pull it back out. If there are more red ones or less red ones, who knows? You put it in again, more red. Random outcome. Then you add team members, and the team members aren't allowed to touch anything, and the blindfold's still on, and still going to put it in there. The team members say, go, fewer red ones. That's for the first round. The next round, they say, Fred, you're not reducing the red ones. The, the red ones, could you please do better? The, Deming stops the game at, at that point, and it's clear that unless you change the, the fundamental process or system, you're not going to see any improvement. So why am I talking about this? When I thought about this regulatory harmonization and, and this whole system that, that exists to, to manage these regulations, what role do small businesses, industry, folks like my company play? I'm afraid we're a lot like the team members in the, the Red Bead experiment. We're, we're often on the sidelines, either applauding or criticizing. And uh, as uh, fundamentally, I'm a PR guy, so uh, I know one of the easiest ways to get a headline is to trash the government. So we do the easy thing often, and instead of being engaged in the process, which I think we need to be more. When I talk to the, the folks at our company about how things are going in, in this area, uh, the answer was a little bit surprising to me, um, darn well. Actually, there are a lot of cases where we've had success, where uh, the, the governments uh, and the agencies in Canada and the U.S. are working together very closely. So a lot of positives. Uh, you'll notice that climate change is on that list. It's only on the list because we have not done too much yet, and nothing catastrophic for a business like ours. We're, we're one of those uh, high-carbon, trade-exposed folks, so uh, not doing very much yet, and having somebody like Minister Prentice in Canada say that 
Canada is not going to move dramatically until the U.S. does is very encouraging to us. Uh, challenges, uh, lots of those as well, and uh, many in the export uh, uh, area, and uh, read the words that came back from our logistics folks when, when I asked them. Uh, they said that there are two different systems. One, user-friendly, lots of reporting capability, easy to upload data, and the other one, rigid, complex, time-consuming, and has the more significant penalties if there are errors or omissions. So. Um, Again, lots of lots of things that we can still work on. My 3 a.m. wake up screaming list is uh, the border. Border is important to us, important to, to everybody, and it's potentially a political issue, so it, it's also a little frightening. Chemicals management, a case where the Canadian system is terrific. Uh, NGOs like it, industry likes it, uh, very positive, risk based, thorough, all of that. The European system is not any of those things, and uh, the U.S. is uh, currently reviewing TOSCA, and our fervent hope is that they will be using the Canadian model rather than uh, REACH in Europe. Final slide, uh, called Shared Air, and um, it's a, a story about a Canadian domestic policy that uh, has almost been developed. Four years ago, the Canadian federal government came out with uh, an air management plan, and they managed to anger the provincial environment ministries, uh, the environmental NGOs, and industry, uh, the irritant trifecta, which you would have said was hard to do. And uh, following the, uh, the, the proposal, uh, a number of the, the NGOs and uh, industry associations got together and said, we really have to be able to do better than that, and asked permission to do so, and, and sent a letter to, to the Prime Minister. So uh, when the Prime Minister receives a, a letter that, that has uh, the Sierra Club, the Lung Association Pollution Pro, and the Mining Association and Forestry and Cement and Chemistry, <laughs> that's an attention getter. It says, okay, uh, go ahead, we'll, we'll give you a shot at that. And uh, four years have passed, and I, I talked to some folks who have been engaged in the, in the process, and they used words like painful, and messy, and sloppy, and aggravating, and nobody is happy. But this week, they actually managed to put something forward, put it back to, to the environment minister, uh, with a proposal that should work. Now, we'll see. But at least they, they did come out with a, a product, and like a labor negotiation, since nobody's happy, it, it's probably a, an okay thing. Yeah. Uh, who's the lady in the, in the picture? Anybody? Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead? Did you say that? Yeah. You did. Outstanding. Margaret Mead, yeah. indeed. Yeah. And uh, ironically, last night, Margaret Mead came up in, in conversation a few times. <laughs> Uh, so what does Margaret Mead have to have to do with all of this? Uh, uh, not remembered very much uh, today. Uh, mostly visible on coffee cups and on T-shirts uh, at this point. And uh, my my favorite Margaret Meadism is the uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, is the only thing that never that, that ever has. And uh, again, uh, as I thought about this system of uh, of regulations and, and harmonization, um, uh, I had to think that, that uh, we are a privileged few. We are the, uh, a small group that can have an influence on something that is fundamentally important uh, because it, if we're able to harmonize regulations, we improve competitiveness and as a result create wealth. And creating wealth is a very good thing in social terms. So. Uh, I thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Uh, Mr. Walker, so when you said the word reach, a term near and dear to the hearts of my Brussels office, because it provides so much business for us, I can imagine. it's brought to mind something. We're sitting here talking about harmonizing U.S. Canada regulatory. I did some work 
for a couple of years with Peter Mandelson, one of the extreme commissioner uh, of the Europe on the Doha issues. One of the things he said many times was, Europe's going to become the dominant figure in world economics because we're going to be the regulator for the world. We're going to be that because of two things. One, we have arguably the EU as a whole, the largest market. But most importantly, we regulate more comprehensively and tougher and stricter than anybody. Never saw something they didn't like to regulate. Can you really do a U.S. Yeah, you all are multinational companies. You have to deal with Europe as well as U.S. and Canada. Can you really do a... Uh, an effective job of harmonizing regulatory regimes just in North America, or are we going to get to a position where multinational companies say, yeah, yeah, but I still got to do the overlay on top of that that I have to do because I got, I got to sell my product in Europe as well as in North America. How does that fit in with a harmonization program like we're talking about here? So I'll, I'll start, and I'm sure everybody will, uh, will want to comment on that. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. We're, we're going to have an appetite to have harmonization at, at as high a level as possible. We also vote with our feet. And uh, investment in our industry uh, in Europe is very, very limited and uh, it's negligible. And, and uh, the, the company that we were bought by uh, an Abu Dhabi concern last year, and uh, they own manufacturing in the Middle East, Europe, and, and North America. And the expansion in that group is in the Middle East. Uh, investment will not flow to Europe. And I, I, I sort of go back to you know addressing that question, my, my observation on data privacy. Um, yes, it is troublesome you know, to deal with Europe. We have the works councils. We have their um, laws, which are awful which can often be strict and sometimes draconian. But we can't let that get in the way right now. We've created a situation where if it's easier to deal with Europe than with North Americans than it is for them to deal with each other, we're moving trade in the wrong direction. So I think given the strength of the, the relationship, it's something that can't be ignored. Also, a lot of multinationals, there, there are industries that work heavily within the continent. And uh, more harmony would, would certainly strengthen and encourage those industries. I think too. Um, I don't think one size fits all. I think that you can find certain regulatory contexts where an outlier can be treated as an outlier. You may create a platform everywhere else that where something works, but then um, it may not work that way. The lowest common denominator can rule, and it, it's going to depend entirely on what regulatory regime you're talking about. And to add to that, I think if you look forward, well forward, um, globalization can can not necessarily mean one big standard on how a company, say, manufactures a product. You may find things like fuel costs driving a global company to produce and not ship as far, produce more locally, lose scale, but uh, because if shipping costs become high enough, that might be the model you adopt. And that either I can see trends in that direction uh, today. Or a piece of cost for the Saudi Arabia stuff that you're talking about, chemicals. But, um, what um, uh, would be useful for uh, uh, Mr. Wilkinson to talk about uh, Larry Herman in Toronto would be the kinds of things that David Fung had mentioned, and that is that industry uh, standards are supplanting, in many cases, government-led standards. And, and to what extent does that affect the chemical industry <coughs> and other industries? Because uh, the governments are, on the regulatory side, domestically notoriously slow, and internationally even slower in getting common standards in place. In the meantime, business is moving ahead. What's your experience in this area? Uh, I can give you an example of uh, the, in the plastics business. Uh, I was part of a, a group that uh, is uh, works on standards for importing products for retail in, in North America and set standards on things like barcode. Uh, and um, I was there because of hangers, clothing hangers, uh, the, uh, the clear plastic ones. Uh, 
in, in order to, to have the system work, uh, you need to have the same hangars in, in Thailand and Vietnam and China. Uh, and uh, uh, Saks on Fifth Avenue uh, knows what to expect, the, the size, how it's going to hang. So uh, an, an organization that uh, came together in order to ensure that, that there was harmonization of uh, the barcodes, the size of the boxes, the, down to the hangers that, that are used. Extremely effective. Uh, remarkably so. Uh, down to the components of the, the hangers, which is why I was there uh, lobbying to have our product used in China. And uh, so uh, I, I am right with uh, Dr. Fung that, that uh, absolutely those organizations are moving far faster than, than governments are. Dr. Fung, do you have a question? Uh, well, I think I just a uh, quick comment in saying that uh, I think in this whole process, uh, especially for because I came from the chemical industry as well, I came from ICI of England. Uh, I was a research manager for Canada. Uh, so I think the other element on this side that is coming up uh, quick is GMO uh, and genetically modified products. Uh, and, and I think that again, you know, this is an, an element which we need to uh, keep an eye on because if we regulate GMO out of existence, uh, it's to our own detriment. China is moving ahead to use GMO rice. Uh, that can increase productivity by sixfold. Now, who is going to argue about China if they have 1.3 billion people eating the GMO rice and they don't turn into monsters? Okay. Uh, so, so I think somewhere along the line, we need to understand that uh, Europe, Europe is really going to pay a price by being the regulatory regime of the world. Because we will all sell it to them, but we are not going to do anything within Europe if they continue to move in that direction. Um, Michael Robinson from Toronto. Just a couple of small comments uh, in, in praise of the emphasis that's been put on by this panel on the utility of private organizations developing the harmonization that that governments then follow and how salutary that is. Uh, on the competition law area, I think we should be aware of the International Bar Association and the work that it did uh, long before uh, governmental organizations got their acts together and started to talk about harmonizing law. I think, uh, and that's totally an organization of private lawyers. We must have been six, seven years ahead of the governments, and it worked, and it spurred them on. And then the other one is just a small comment on uh, the corruption issue. Uh, I'm on the board of Transparency International Canadian Bunch, and we were hideously embarrassed year after year uh, because we had to report to the head office in Berlin, which then reported to the OECD that everybody was out of step but Canada, <laughs> i.e. We were the only OECD country that still operated on the nationality, sorry, on the territoriality principle in enforcing our law. Uh, but an interesting gloss on that, and, and why the government did that silly thing, is we have been bellyaching for so long about extraterritorial application of US law, particularly <coughs> competition law in Canada, that the government said, oh my goodness, we can't come out now and say it's all a fine thing. And every year we have to file our reports and, and, and say um, that, that this was sort of a national disgrace. Then finally, out of the blue, comes Bill C-31, which did exactly what we've been asking them to do for 10 years, specifically change the act and say the nationality principle applies full stop. Where is the bill? Nowhere. The Prime Minister prorogued Parliament again, and it died on the order paper, so it has to be reintroduced. But it, but it will be. And the RCMP, I can tell you, are just salivating. They have cases prepared, I can't give you any more details, ready to go on the nationality principle against Canadians, which is why we had a little seminar, Transparency International, last month in, in Toronto to try to scare the heck out of Canadian business that they better be ready to pay more attention to that statute. 
Okay, well thank you, and, and thank you for your indulgence. We're about 20 minutes over now, and we don't want to hold you for the lunch. I would like to thank my panelists, and this is, they've had some very interesting points I found interesting. And thank you for your attention as well. Okay, on lunch. Lunch is a brown bag lunch. We know you.